Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here for Evidence of Evolution. So we're going to get into lots of different types of evidence of evolution in here. Uh, so I'm just going to get right to it. So first up, uh, we're going to describe the type of data that provides evidence for evolution. And so the important thing to note is there's lots of different types of evidence for evolution. Now, historically speaking, it was just physical things. It was literally things just like the anatomy of structures. And so we would look at uh, analogous structures of two things that had legs, but the underlying structures behind these analogous legs uh, are different. And so they must be from different types of organisms. And then we could also then look at homologous structures and say, even though these are have very different functions, they, they clearly have the same underlying structure. And so they must share a recent common ancestor. But since those physical appearances, we've added on some things like where are organisms found, the biogeography of where you find distribution of species. We also have added the fossil record, specifically looking at locations of ancestors and then using those structures to track descendancy. And then we've used th structures like embryology, how do things look during development, and then obviously the molecular techniques of comparing nucleotide sequences has played a huge role in how we compare organisms to find their common ancestry. So let's talk about how evolution is supported by scientific evidence uh, from many disciplines. And so again, this is a really good example of how we like to use science specifically, and that is that when you come up with a theory, and evolution is a theory, what it does is it unifies a broad swath of observations and a broad swath of fields. And so as new evidence comes about, even if it's from disparate fields of, of science or even mathematics, uh, there is a consistency to that model. And when there are things that don't add up, uh, the model can therefore be refined in order to better explain um, how the evidence may come together. And so some of the disciplines that we look at are the geographical dis, uh, disciplines of looking at where we find different types of organisms. Again, geological evidence uh, would be both the evidence of rock layers and rock structures, but also fossils as well. Physical, as I mentioned, the anatomy, we look at those type of things. And then we have biochemical, and that would really be our DNA and RNA and our protein sequences that we look at, as well as certain metabolic uh, pathways that you could uh, find as parallel uh, in different types of organisms. And then uh, mathematical data, is both going to be the mathematical analysis that we will see of some of that uh, biochemical data, um, but also some of the modeling data that we can look at, which will mathematically uh, help us calculate how allele frequencies shift and also how we can uh, compare two different data sets using mathematical certainty to uh, approximate uh, how long uh, organisms have been evolving independently um, and many other mathematical operations that could be utilized as we move forward. All right, and so again, this diagram here really shows us our, our canine lineages and various organisms and how closely or more distantly related they are as we have uh, seen uh, time going on. And this has been something that's been uh, then modified dramatically uh, as more data has come come about. There actually was a time where uh, there was a big controversy about whether dogs were more wolf-like or more jackal-like, and it has been through this collection of various types of data that has led to the modern view of dogs being closely related to modern-day gray wolves. All right, so let's talk about some of these things. Let's start with the morphology, um, then we'll talk a little bit about the biochemistry, and then a little bit about the geological data. So Let's start with the morphology. And so I mentioned before uh, the idea of having homologous structures. So even though uh, the forearm of a human, the forelimb of a dog, the forelimb of a bird, and the forelimb of a whale all have ultimately different functions, they have an underlying structure that is one upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, a group of bones that represent a wrist, and then some digits. And this conserved morphology suggests that these share a recent common ancestor. When we combine that with the biochemistry, again, when you look at the biochemistry of the DNA and you look for or uh, key structures, you will see all of these organisms that we see here, they're going to share 
a certain percentage of DNA. And more importantly, as you look, look and dive deep into certain uh, either developmental genes, and developmental genes will play a big role in uh, the formation of a forelimb, or if you look at certain metabolic genes, you will actually be able to get a molecular clock of how long organisms have been evolving independently by accumulating various mutations, yet retaining that function of the gene that is at play. And then over here on the far right, we see the example of geology and these geological impressions or geological fossils are the types of things that we utilize when we want to figure out how organisms began in a specific place and then diverged from that location to new locations or how um, in modern day species could have evolved from now extinct species. And so we will use all of these to help paint a picture of how modern day organisms have changed over time to fill the current niches that they currently occupy or how certain organisms that no longer exist may have existed in different geological time and how they may have interacted. So in addition to those pieces, we could talk about how molecular morphological and uh, genetic data from both extant, meaning living and extinct organisms, as to our understanding of evolution. And so we can take a look at the idea of fossils being dated using various methods by looking at the age of the rocks that they're in, looking at radiometric dating, such as carbon-14, and then also looking at geographical data. And so let's start with talking a little bit about uh, what it's meant by the age of fossils. So uh, in this upper right hand, I've got this plant that's, that's here, and this plant fossil is in a particular location. When I find a fossil like this, I will look at what other things are found in this layer of rock. And so that is what's known as relative dating. And so if we've already got estimates for how long ago something existed, and then we find a new fossil, and in that fossil impression next to that, we find additional fossils, it gives us a relative impression of how long ago this rock became a fossil or this layer of rock was on the surface and has now led to fossilization. This is not a very precise methodology, but for a long time, this was our key way of figuring at least sequence of when certain things li lived and when certain things died was the relative uh, age of the rocks um, based off of their position. This is sometimes referred to as the law of superposition, where uh, materials at the top of a dig site are going to be the things that got placed there most recently. As you dig down lower and lower, you get to older and older specimens. Now, in addition to that, we have moved heavily into what is known as radiometric dating, and that is by looking at the rate of decay of isotopes from different commonly occurring radioactive isotopes, including things like carbon-14. So carbon-14, what you'll see up in the atmosphere is uh, we have that plants are taking in carbon dioxide, and some percentage of the atmosphere has carbon-14. Most carbon is carbon-12, but there is some carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So while living organism is there and they are fixing carbon into their tissues, a certain amount of that carbon, a very small amount, but a certain amount of that carbon is going to contain carbon-14. And it will continue to accumulate that as it accumulates biomass throughout its life. Once that organism dies, it is going to stop bringing in carbon-14, but that carbon-14 that is in that organism is going to begin to decay. And so if I look at the ratio of how much carbon-14 remains in an organism over time, by using half-life and radioactive decay, we can then get an estimate of how long ago this organism must have been alive based off of the radioactive decay of carbon-14. Now, because carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life compared to other types of radioactive molecules that we would use in fossil dating, this is great for things that involved homo sapiens. You're really very, very accurate out to anywhere from 75,000 to 100,000, depending on the size of the sample. You get really good data for carbon-14. If we're going to find something that is older, we're going to need to use things with longer half-lives, things like potassium or other molecules that are similarly brought in by living organisms fixed into tissues, and that as that organism dies, that that amount of whatever that radioactive isotope that they took in from the environment will then begin to decay, and then you can make their estimates that way. So uh, 
radiometric dating is there. And then the third point, this geographical data. Again, we look at the location of specific fossils. We know what the conditions and climate of those particular locations are, and it helps paint a picture of the niches that were filled by specific organisms in specific times in order to get a sense of what was going on geologically and geographically in those locations to get an understanding of how an organism could have become extinct based off of the conditions in that particular location. Now, additionally, we can talk about things like morphology. And morphological homologies that include things like vestigial structures are also a key feature. And so here we have a whale fossil. And in this whale fossil, you can see the giant whale skull. You can see the upper arm bone and the shoulder. Um, these are really, really useful when comparing whales to other modern day and since extinct organisms that have a similar forelimb it really gives us a good sense of that. But you'll notice that structure C is this small diminutive structure, and that is a vestigial whale hip and hind leg. Now, as we all know, whales really don't have hind legs. They are in the ocean, they swim. So finding a structure like a vestigial hip bone provides us some evidence that this modern day whale is a descendant of an organism that would have been a tetrapod, would have had hind limbs. And that by piecing together other fossils that share some of the modern day features that we see and some of the fossils that we have, we get a picture of how modern day whales came about through the re-entry into the ocean that would have occurred over the last 40 to 50 million years as uh, there was an open niche and whales re-entered the sea to fill that large consumer niche that they currently hold in many parts of the oceans. Now, the other thing that we can do, in addition to our, you know, morphology that we talked about and also looking at the fossil record or the geology, is to compare DNA nucleotide sequences or protein sequences um, based off their amino acid sequences to help provide some evidence of evolution and figure out common ancestry. And so what we will do is we will get various samples and we'll look at some key proteins or some key sequences that code for specific proteins, and we will compare those and see how many mutations have accumulated, what percentage of the genome is conserved that is the same compared to the other organisms that we want to compare it to. And so what you can see here is a collection of fish that based off of the number of mutations in the given protein that they were comparing, they were able to look and figure out how closely or distantly related these various organisms were Again, based off of number of mutations at specific key genes that are, tend to be highly conserved within the particular group. Now, one of the other things to note is that we look at the fundamental molecular and cellular features that are shared across all domains of life in order to provide some evidence. And so... Uh, as you are probably aware, classification of living things has changed dramatically over the last several hundred years, starting by just classifying all living things as plants or animals. And then eventually we had plants or animals and then like microbes. And then we started to say plants, animals, fungi, things that aren't plants, animals, fungi, but also not bacteria, and then bacteria. And now we actually have three broad domains of life, which are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And the way we have this, and we've come back to what is known as the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, the way that the model for this has come about is by looking at a structure that is common in all living cells, and that is the ribosome. And so we know the ribosome heavily conserved because every living thing has a ribosome. Now, are all ribosomes the same? No. The subunit sizes of a bacteria versus an archaea versus a eukarya uh, ribosome, they're different. They have different sizes. They have different structures. So there is variation, but the functional element of them is, is conserved and uh, components of it are also conserved. And so if we have the same functioning structure, even if there's variation in its parts and sizes, if we then find the basic sequences that lead to the formation of that ribosome and we compare those, that's going to combine both fundamental molecular comparisons and cellular features that else allow us to build this really complex web of living things. And if you find two organisms that share the same 
subunits to their ribosome, that's pretty strong argument that they belong in that same domain. And then you can look at the variation of those ribosomal structures once you've got that down to say, oh, this has this size small subunit and this size large subunit, what is this most like? Then I can compare those and figure out common ancestry amongst the living things. Now, the other thing in addition to ribosomes that's often used, and I apologize about the size of the image that's on here, but it's from a very complex paper. In addition to those fundamental um, comparisons of ribosomes, we can look at molecular and cellular features and processes that are conserved across organisms. And so this is a paper uh, that came out uh, a little more than 10 years ago, which is called The Conservation of Evolutionary Modularity of Metabolism. And what these different colors over here on the left represent are these are different giant classifications of types of metabolism that are seen in different things. And then this is a heat map that compares the different domains of life. And so what this allows us to do is to look and say, what kind of metabolic features are conserved regardless of what type of organism you are looking at? And this is a really interesting heat map because it gives us really clear pictures of where certain types of organisms, regardless of their domain, all have to do the same type of thing. And so what we end up finding is that the this is a really useful piece of information for comparing two types of organisms is if we look at the types of enzymes they have for, for example, glycolysis, the breaking down of sugars, or... Um, making and metabolizing amino acids. All living things have amino acids. All require them. All consume or produce them in certain ways. And so when I look at these various um, structures, I can get a really detailed map of how living things have evolved and changed over time by comparing how similar or different these are across different groups of organisms. Now, Another thing that we can use is the structural and functional evidence that supports relatedness of organisms in all domains. So when we talk all domains, again, we're talking those cells that have a nucleus versus those that don't. And for a long time, again, we said put all of those that didn't have a nucleus in the same bucket, but we've since understood that some of those things that we used to call prokaryotes, and again, prokaryotes is a uh, not a true cladistic term because the archaea and the bacteria are really distinctly different groups, but when we look at them, yeah, they lack a nucleus. And so they have these nucleoid regions. But we can look at their ribosomes and say, are they similar? Are they different? We can look at their membranes and their cell walls. And ultimately, looking at those structures are fundamentally what led us to being convinced that it wasn't appropriate to have one group called prokaryotes, but to have two separate groups that lack a nucleus. Because when we look at their genetic material, yes, they have DNA. All living things have DNA, but how different is the DNA? They all have plasma membranes, but how do those plasma membranes different? They all have cytoplasm. They all have ribosomes. And by looking at these, we see a commonality supporting that they all relate back to a last universal common ancestor. But by looking at the differences, it allows us to paint a picture of that phylogeny that I showed you a few slides ago. All right, well, that's a pretty quick summary of some of the key pieces of evidence of evolution. Um, I hope that was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.